Hi there, my name is Ken Irvin. I'm the Education Coordinator at Guelph Museums. Today I'd like to tell you about this amazing golf course and why the city of Guelph turned down the gift of owning it from one of North America's wealthiest men. This is Cut and Fields, one of the most prestigious golf courses in Canada. Its creation was the idea of Arthur William Cutton. So who was Arthur Cutton? Well, Arthur was born in Guelph in 1870. He was one of nine children born to Walter Hoyt Cutton and Annie McFadden. And they lived at 74 Paisley Street in a home known as Sunset. And it's still standing, and here's a picture of it. His father was a prominent Guelph barrister. But in 1881, he tried his hand at banking, and he bought the Guelph Loan and Mortgage Company. And the business wasn't very successful and failed in 1888. His depositors lost all of their money, which amounted to about $20,000. He had several criminal charges laid against him, but he was able to stay out of jail and he returned to work as a barrister. But this incident would have a big impact on Arthur as he was growing up. But growing up, Arthur did love sports. He played both cricket and baseball with his brothers. Uh, he preferred baseball, and it was rumored that he wanted to play professionally. After high school, and part of it was spent at Guelph Collegiate, uh, he worked at a job for $4 a week with the American consulate in Guelph. He thought it was really amusing that the United States government officially employed him. He worked there for six months, saving up his money to seek his fortune and hoping to play professional ball in the United States. Here's a picture of, of Arthur and some of his family, and Arthur's the one in the dark suit. This, he's at age 20 here. Uh, and at that age, he left Guelph for Chicago, and he had $90 in his pocket, a trunk filled with his belongings, and a penny-farthing bicycle. His first job in Chicago was at Marshall Fields Wholesale House to manage their stock. He was paid $7 a week, but his room went with $6 a week, so he didn't stay there very long. Um, he had changed jobs several times over the next few years while still playing baseball in the summer, but he never made it as a pro. He wasn't big enough. He was only about this tall. Um, he discovered his real talent at his job with Stanford White & Company. He looked after the foreign invoices and calculated exchange rates, and his work took him to and from the Chicago Stock Exchange. And this sparked a real interest in the stock market. In 1896, after working at Stanford White & Company for six years, he borrowed $800 from the company's owner to buy a membership as a pit broker on the stock exchange. Within two years, he had an $1,800 a year salary with a $500 bonus and made $4,000 on the exchange that year. He had found his true calling. By 1906, he was a very wealthy young man with his own investment operation, a seat on the Chicago Board of Trade, and a new wife, Maud Boomer, at his side. He earned the, the name Wheat King for his buying and selling of stock in wheat and grain. And at the time, he was famous throughout the United States. In one year, his trading in wheat brought him a profit of between 12 and $30 million. But not all of his deals were successful, as he both made and lost a fortune in cotton. But Arthur didn't like publicity, even though he had his picture on the cover of Time magazine. He was rarely photographed or interviewed. Even with his celebrity and wealth, he never forgot his hometown. He paid off the mortgage on the Guelph YMCA, and he gave a total of $13,000 to the Guelph Cemetery Commission. He gave numerous donations to St. George's Church, uh, a clock, a new organ, choir stalls, an organ loft, and the carillion of 23 bells imported from England that were in honor of his father, mother, and departed brother. His biggest and most visible gift to Guelph was to be a modern hotel, a full-size golf course, and a general recreation area with a baseball diamond, a football field, rugby pitch, running track, tennis courts, playground, and clubhouse at a cost of about $2 million. In 1929, he started to make arrangements for the construction of the recreation area. The president of the Ontario Agricultural College, George Christie, traveled to, the, to Chicago to consult with Arthur in order to create suitable athletic fields for the school. A large farm of about 160 acres close to the college and along the Speed River, which is just behind me, uh, was owned by the McDonald family and it was purchased for the recreation fields and the golf course. As a side note, the grandson of the farm owner was noted Guelph painter Evan McDonald, uh, who painted many famous portraits, like the portrait of the university president, George Christie, and the really famous portrait of uh, Lieutenant Colonel John McRae. The hotel uh, that he wanted to build unfortunately never materialized. According to the Guelph Mercury, there were two possible reasons for this. Either land speculators who own the land proposed for the hotel found out that Arthur Cutton wanted to buy the land and try to get too much money for their property, or tenants in a building that he purchased for the hotel site refused to move. 
but whatever the reason, the million dollar hotel proposed for downtown Guelph was not built. The golf course was built. Uh, it was designed by renowned Canadian golf course architect Stanley Thompson and was assisted by Hall of Fame golfer and friend of Arthur's, uh, Charles Chick Evans. Horses and tools were borrowed from the Ontario Agricultural College to move rocks and trees and to create the 6,400 yard long par 70 course. The Cut and Fields Golf Club officially opened in June uh, 1931 at a cost of $750,000 which was an enormous amount of money to uh, spend during a depression. And after Arthur had reported, he lost between 50 and $90 million in the stock market crash. Arthur actually missed the grand opening of the course as he was at Colgate University in New York, receiving an honorary doctorate. Uh, one of his brothers-in-law, George Foster, was appointed course manager. And Arthur's intention was to give the golf course and the clubhouse to the city of Guelph. But the mayor at the time, Beverly Robson, declined the offer. He felt that the course might run at a deficit and end up costing the city money. The course was then run as a pay-as-you-play course. We're now at uh, Woodlawn Memorial Park, right beside the Cut and Obelisk. Uh, in November of 1935, the United States Secretary of Agriculture charged Arthur with improper trading activities, and he tried to have him barred from trading on all future exchanges in the United States. This may have been the trigger to cause Arthur's health to fail. On Christmas Day of 1935, Arthur had a heart attack. He recovered, but was in poor health until he passed away five months later on June 24, 1936, at the age of 65. There was a funeral service held for him in Chicago and another one at St. George's Church in Guelph. He was buried at Woodlawn Cemetery in Guelph under this obelisk that had already been purchased and installed. Uh, at the time, this obelisk was actually the largest single piece of granite in North America. Arthur's will left everything to his wife, Maude, as they didn't have any children. Although his estate at its peak was valued at over $100 million, it was in 1936 valued at only $350,000. The United States government sued the estate for alleged income tax evasion. The estate had to sell off many properties to pay the tax bill. One of the properties that was sold was cut in fields. Before the club was sold, the IRS paid it a visit. There are rumors that Arthur's fortune was moved to Canada and hidden. The IRS didn't believe that Arthur had lost so much of his fortune and that some of it must be hidden. So they actually searched the clubhouse. They knocked on the walls and dug up parts of the course, but never found a cent. Although today it appears there's a lot of digging going on with nine irons and wedges. The new owners of Cutton Fields were course architect Stanley Thompson and Donald Ross, who was the owner of the Maple Leafs baseball club. They purchased the course in 1939 for $22,500. Well, that's a big difference from the $750,000 it cost to build it. In 1940, the clubhouse was taken over by the Royal Canadian Air Force to build Air Force personnel training at the Ontario Agricultural College. By 1943, the Air Force moved out and the club returned to normal. Many college faculty and Guelphites visited the clubhouse over the years to enjoy the view of the city and the fine dining. My parents actually had their very first date at the clubhouse, which seemed to turn out pretty well as they were married for over 50 years. When Stanley Thompson passed away in 1953, uh, club members and the board were concerned that the club may be sold for real estate development. Uh, to preserve the club, uh, Leyland Electric and Federal Wire and Cable became equal partners and purchased the club for $100,000. And the club was then unofficially known as the Electric Club. And these two companies decided to diversify the ownership and sold 16.6% .6 of their shares to six local companies, which were the Biltmore Hat Company, Fiberglass Canada, the Calendar Foundry, International Malleable Iron, Timothy Eaton Company, and uh, Matthew Wells Limited. Between the 1950s and the early 1980s, the University of Guelph acquired mostly through donation and some purchasing all of the shares uh, from the shareholding individuals and companies. By 1993, the university became the sole owner of Cut and Fields. Cut and Fields stature in the world of golf has grown. It's now a private club, moving away from pay as you play. It's hosted the Ontario Open Golf Tournament, and over the years, additions were added to the clubhouse for party and banquet space, as well as squash and tennis courts. Now, the club keeps changing with the times to respond to the Guelph's uh, recreation, special event, and dining needs. Cut and Fields is a green jewel in what is now the middle of Guelph and thanks to Arthur Cutton's vision and his love of his hometown. Uh, now that you know what happened here, please don't come digging in the golf course. The Mission Fortune isn't here, I don't think. Uh, 
But thanks for joining me today and learning about Arthur Cutton. And a big thanks to J.J. Hubert for his assistance and extensive knowledge of Arthur Cutton and Cutton Fields.